Please turn your Bibles to what some call the most immoral chapter in the Bible, Romans chapter 9. This is one of those passages that if you're of a certain theological persuasion, you don't want to preach it. You'll skip over it. But if you're of a different theological persuasion, the biblical persuasion, you can't wait to get to this chapter, Romans chapter 9. It is one of those chapters that exalts the greatness of God, and it just crushes the pride of man. Everything about this chapter just screams God is transcendently sovereign. He sits in the heavens and he does whatever he pleases. This is a great chapter. This is a chapter that evokes praise. This is a chapter that makes you think ah, that I would get to worship such a God. I call this the most troubling doctrine that comforts you the most when you're in trouble. The sovereignty of God. And by the way, just so I could take the edge off, if you're fairly new to the church, think about this. We're made in God's likeness and image. We're image bearers. Even though the fall tainted that, we're still image bearers. And so some things we do are similar to what God does. And he even says, be holy as I am holy, for instance. And you can tell what's wrapped up in us shows that we are image bearers. We like to choose. We like to choose our favorite sports teams. We like to choose our spouse. We like to choose where we live. We like to choose what church we go to. We like to choose, don't we? But what we love in ourselves, the ability to choose, sometimes we don't like in God. And here we'll find out in Romans chapter 9 that God chooses Isaac over Ishmael. He chooses Moses over Pharaoh. He chooses Jacob over Esau. God chooses. And once you can just submit to that hard doctrine that God chooses, remember, no one deserves anything. The question shouldn't be, why does God not choose? The question should be, I can't believe he chooses anybody knowing how bad we are. Romans chapter 9 is the chapter that shows by nature and by essence, God is God. R.C. Sproul said, if you were God, your favorite doctrine would be the sovereignty of God. Maybe that's true, maybe that's not. But the text in Daniel says, he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants on earth, and none can stay his hand or say, what are you doing? Romans chapter 9, the sovereignty of God. J. Gresham Machen once said, The more I have looked out upon the state of the church at the present time, the more I have contemplated recent church history, the more firmly I am convinced that error regarding predestination leads inevitably to more and more error and often constitutes the entering wedge by which the entire Christian testimony of individuals and of churches is undermined. I think he's right. Although if you don't submit to scripture, you might be like that guy in Northern California who was attending a service when Ray Stedman was preaching, and he had to run out during the middle of the service saying, I can't worship a God who's like that in Romans 9. What's been happening so far as we've been going through the book of Romans? As you know, instead of going through the five-year survey, we're going chapter by chapter. And last week, we looked at chapter 8, and now today, chapter 9. Here's what's happening. Take a look at the very end of chapter 8. It says, does it not, in verse 35 of Romans 8, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Then he gives a list of all kinds of things, tribulation, distress, persecution, etc. He says, no, verse 37, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us, this great risen Jesus, both our representative and substitute. For I am sure, verse 38, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any thing else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And if you're a thinking person, you should say something like this. Then what about Israel? 
How can my salvation be secure? How can I not lose my salvation? How can I have eternal security if Israel was chosen by God? And then now take a look at Israel. How can I be sure of my faith and the love of God if the love of God for Israel seems to be waning? Is Paul's gospel true when you look at the state of Israel? And Paul is going to answer that question in Romans chapter 9. I like it how he just anticipates these questions. And he vindicates God's righteousness. Certainly Israel sinned. Certainly Israel failed. But the ultimate source of Israel's state is because God has determined that not every Israelite is supposed to go to heaven. Distinguishing grace of God is in play here. Now, as we work through this chapter, let, re, let me remind you of something about election. Election is very personal. Uh, God doesn't say, I'm just going to choose a clump out. I'm just going to choose a bunch of John Doe's, a bunch of Jane Doe's, a bunch of anonymous people. Election is very, very personal. Rufus is called chosen in the Lord. This is much different than people when they think of election as to whom it may concern. God chooses people by name, not by number, as Kurt Daniel says, nor by group. Jesus knows his sheep and calls them all by name. This is, an, this is a distinct, definite choosing, not vague and nondescript. One man said he has placed name tags at each seat. It's not like a general call to a banquet. How can God be faithful and Israel is in the condition she's in? Why are some individual Jews saved and not others? And Paul's answer in Romans chapter 10, excuse me, Romans chapter 9 is because God is God and he only originally intended to choose some of Israel, not all. Let me give you six proofs of God's sovereign Distinguishing grace in Romans chapter 9, if you'd like an outline. Six proofs of God's sovereign distinguishing grace so that you might trust Him, that you might have confidence in His Word, that you might have joy in your salvation. Lots of people want to give you the second blessing. I've been approached by people, they want me to have the second blessing. And I think they mean maybe speaking in tongues or getting knocked down or uh, slain in the Spirit or I don't know what they actually mean sometimes. But friends... This is the second blessing. The first blessing is, of course, the great blessing that you realize you have your sins forgiven based on the work of another Christ Jesus, and then to realize He's sovereign. He didn't have to pick anyone. He still would have been just and right not to pick one, but He picked people. That's an amazing thing. Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth is the true Messiah. The Jewish people are the covenant people of God. So what's going on with the Jews now? And Paul answers that in Romans 9. The eternal, our ultimate reason for the rejection of Israel is God's sovereign purposes. Let's take a look at chapter 9, verse 1. As we begin the chapter, that as long as it is in the Bible, Arminianism cannot be true. I am speaking the truth in Christ, Paul says in Romans 9. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. Paul has grief and sorrow for Israel's current condition. And you can feel it, you can sense it in Romans 9, 3, similar to Moses back in Exodus. You can hear the echo of Moses, a true soul winner's heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ the Messiah for the sake of my brothers. He's talking about the Jews. My kinsmen according to the flesh. David Brainerd was a New Englander who loved the North American Indians. And he said, I dream of lost souls. I care not what sufferings I undergo as long as I see souls saved. That's exactly what Paul had here. He loved the Jewish people. Reminds me of the story about two preachers. I hear you dismissed your pastor. What was wrong? Well, he kept telling us we were going to hell. 
Well, what does a new pastor say? The new pastor says we're going to hell too. So what's the difference? Well, the difference is that when the first one said it, he sounded like he was glad of it. And when the new man says it, he sounds like it's breaking his heart. Paul says, I love the Jewish people. And it is breaking my heart that they're turning their back on their Messiah. He says in verses 4 and following, they've got lots of opportunity, lots of privilege. He's lamenting lost opportunities, lost privileges for the nation of Israel. They are Israelites, verse 4. And to them belong the, and then he lists eight different opportunities. Eight blessings from God showing the, the depth of God's love poured out to this nation. And he gives them the adoption, verse 4. Israel was the firstborn son of God, adopted by God. The cov uh, excuse me, the second one, the glory, the divine glory, the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night, lead in the nation of Israel. What kind of guidance is that? Loving Father's guidance. The covenants, probably the unconditional covenants of the New Testament, of the Old Testament. Abrahamic covenant they were given, the Davidic covenant, the new covenant. Oh, God just poured out his blessings on Israel, didn't he? The giving of the law, Romans 9, 4 goes on to say. The Mosaic law, the worship, our service of God, priesthood, offering, sacrifices, temple, high liturgy. The promises, messianic promises of the one who would come with the great prophet, priest, and king. The patriarchs of the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Joseph, Jacob. Maybe at the best is found in verse 5, according to the flesh, is the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. The deity of Jesus Christ. They've been given the best, the supreme privilege, Jesus the Messiah, the God-man from Israel. But there's an Israel within an Israel. And now Paul gives these six proofs of God's sovereign hand, showing that Israel's rejection is part of God's plan. It's designed. It's designed to give you praise, designed to solve the problem of how do you call the Gentiles into this salvation. Proof number one of God's sovereignty that should drive you to trust Him and praise Him. God's Word endorses a partial, a partial choosing. God's Word endorses a partial choosing. God hasn't gone back on His Word. It says in verse 6, but it is not as though the Word of God has failed. The Old Testament hasn't failed. Romans chapter 8 hasn't failed. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ Jesus? For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Fascinatingly, that word failed there in verse 6 is like a ship that's supposed to be going this way and it goes a different way. God's word hasn't gone off course. Not all of those of Israel, the Liddish, literal Jewish nation, are spiritual believing Israel. There's an ethnic person who's an Israelite and there's a real believer. Now one of the things you need to do as we go to chapters 9, 10, and 11 in Romans, this week, next week, and the following week, when you see the word Israel, you'll find it in these three chapters 11 times. And in every case, listen, in every case, it refers to ethnic or national Israel. Israel, just like it's used in the Old Testament. God's choice, Israel. But the elect nation does not mean every person in it is elect. The Abrahamic covenant was never meant to be every person who calls himself a Jew. You can even look down in chapter 9, verse 27. There's only the remnant that will be saved. See that in 927? Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, it is the remnant that shall be saved. God's word always talks about the remnant. Election as a nation does not preclude God's judgment of people who are unbelievers in the nation of Israel. When you read Israel, there's the elect and the non-elect, in other words. It's not new, it's not strange, it's just biblical. It's a biblical divine prerogative. Number two, proof number two. 
God sovereignly chooses to bless only through Isaac and not through the other children of Abraham. God chooses sovereignly to bless through Isaac and not any other children. How many other children did Abraham have? Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I'm one of them. <laughs> well, we always think of Abraham having Isaac, Ishmael, but there are other kids as well. Let's find out. God just chose Isaac over Ishmael. Why? Because he wanted to. He did it on purpose. And not all the children of Abraham, because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. The sovereign election of some. For this, verse 9, is what the promise said. About this time next year I will return and Sarah shall have a son. Now we know that Hagar and Abraham had Ishmael. But Sarah is going to have the son, and not through Ishmael, the promises will come, but through Isaac. But did you know after Sarah died, Abraham had six other sons by a new wife? Anybody know the name? Very nice. Keturah. She bore to him Zimran, Joxhan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. To be a physical descendant of Abraham isn't enough. Is that okay to do? God says through Isaac, but not through Ishmael or any of the other kids? Of course it's fine. God rejected Ishmael. He rejected Zimran. He rejected Joksam. He did not select Medan. He did not choose Midian. He chose Isaac. Okay for God to do? Absolutely. Number three. Proof three that God's electing sovereign grace is promoted in the Bible, discussed in the Bible. It's everywhere in the Bible. By the way, that's one of my favorite things when you start understanding this doctrine and you just think, I know it's hard, but I'll submit to it. You begin to read the Bible, and then where do you find this doctrine? It's like it's on every page. It just keeps showing up. God's a sovereign choice. God sovereignly, number three, chose Jacob, and he did not choose Esau. By God's sovereign divine choice, he chose Jacob and not Esau. See, because here's what you could be asking yourself. Isaac and Ishmael had the same father, but different mothers. Hagar, Keturah, Sarah. So now Paul zooms in on this, this, this next choosing has to do with same dad, same mom. Proof three, God sovereignly chose Jacob as he contracts this farther. Verse 10, and not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, when? When they did something good? When Jacob pleased God more than his brother? Though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad. Why? You might want to underline this part of the verse. In order that God's purpose of election, in God's purpose of choice, to call out, to choose, to select. There's a bunch of apples in a, in a bag and you pick one of those out. That's the word. God's purpose of election, selection might continue. Not because of works. Because if they did something good, then God chose them based on their goodness. Not because of work, but because of him who calls. She was told the older will serve the younger. As it is written. It's nothing new. Paul goes right back to the Bible. Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Paul is beginning to explain why some Jews are picked and some Jews aren't. The older shall serve the younger. Jacob's to have the priority. Same mom, same dad. And then he uses this idiom in verse 13. Jacob I loved, but Esau I have hate, hated. Can God do whatever he wants with sinful creatures? The answer is yes. Does God owe salvation to anyone? See, the second we start thinking to ourselves, the word grace, swirling around the word grace, orbiting around grace, has words like ought, deserve. No, that can't be. That's not grace. Now, some like to say the word hate means to love less. 
James Montgomery Boyce said, even if the word hate should be understood to mean love less, this loving less is nevertheless of a sufficiently negative nature to account for Esau being rejected by God rather than being chosen. Paul is using the example to illustrate how God chooses one and not another. Call the rejection what you will. To love one and to hate another. Schreiner said, even if the option is correct that he just is loved less, which is doubtful here, it hardly lessens the problem. For the point of the text is that God set his affectionate love upon Jacob and withheld it from Esau. Now, Spurgeon's always good here for a quote. As to Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. A, once, a woman once said to Spurgeon, I cannot understand why God should say that he hated Esau. That, Spurgeon replied, is not my difficulty, madam. My trouble is to understand how God could love. Remember Jacob? Jacob, how could God love Jacob? Jacob have I loved. So if you can't get your mind around God hating Esau, then let's really blow our minds and figure out how does God love Jacob of all people? But the text is clear. It did not please God to choose Esau. Now, lots of times if I teach younger kids, even when I teach adults, and you talk about certain doctrines like this, at the beginning, people just are kind of, okay, no problem. And then the heat gets turned up a little bit, and you can kind of see them going through their contortions. And pretty soon, you're just like, you can just see their hand is getting ready to go up. And they're not really sure if it's the right kind of culture, and we're overseas. And then finally, it's just like a proud fifth grader. They just have to do this, and they almost have to hold their arm up. I've got a question. And my question is, I'm having a hard time processing this. How can this be? Ever held your hand up so long uh, for a question? You had to just brace it? Well, you, you, you don't do that here, maybe, I guess. I don't know. But this is what's happening here. This kind of thing, God chooses some and not others, flies in the face of everything we hold dear here in America and across the world. Our independence, our self-will, our freedom, our freedom of the will. Who are you to tell me, oh God? That's not righteous. Verse 14. Here we go. Hands go up. Questions are anticipated. What should we then say? God's not what? Fair. Well, you don't want fair, by the way. Is there injustice on God's part? And then Paul uses the thing that's the, the, the strongest in the Greek language. No, by no means. King James, I think, is God forbid. Contrary to what you might think, remember, friends, and I'll clump myself with you. We are a fallen people, so our minds don't think perfectly, do they? And we are a finite people. We are created beings. We're not the infinite creator. There's no injustice on God's part. If God selected some with sovereign freedom, is he guilty of injustice? No, not at all. No way. God forbid. Second Chronicles 19, with the Lord our God, there is no injustice. Are we to say God is unjust? And by the way, at the end of the day, if somehow you say, you know what, I don't like this God who chooses, and I could never worship a God who chooses on that day when you stand before Him, you won't have any excuse. Because whatever God does is just. Whose definition of justice? Who establishes right and wrong? Paul is anticipating what's going on here. Now, by the way, if we are Arminian, and if we believe that God chooses based on what somebody does, looks down the quarters of time, sees them believe, then chooses, this question would never come up. Doug Moose said all he would have needed to have said was, of course God is not unjust in choosing Jacob and rejecting Esau, for his choosing took into account the faith of the one and the unbelief of the other. But that's not what Paul does. He actually pushes it farther. He drives it. He doesn't play it down. You are not supposed to object to God's choosing anyone. It's not unjust. Sovereign mercy, is it unjust? You say, well, he just talking about nations. 
Well, now we move to individuals, that's for sure, verse 15. Uh, if anybody ever tells you Romans 9 is only about nations, what's the difference? God chooses an individual to go to heaven, and he passes over someone to not go to heaven, and they go to hell. Our God does the very same thing to thousands of people in a nation. It doesn't get you off the hook to go, this is nations, because nations are full of individual people. But now he uses language of individuals, and he uses language of what is the essence of God. If you'd like to pull back the figurative curtain and see what's at the center of God's being, we find that in verse 15 of Romans 9, and Paul again quotes the Bible, making no defense for God, no apology for God, solely resting on Scripture. Is God unjust to withhold grace? That is the question. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom Singular words here, individuals on whom I have compassion. Thankfully, he doesn't say, I will have mercy on none. Nobody deserves it. There are no stipulations here, no parameters, no externals, no influences. I am who I am and I do what I do. The character of God reveals by essence and nature. He chooses, he selects, he picks, he's sovereign and distinguishing. This is the story. We don't have time to go into it now of Exodus chapter 33. God, show me your glory, Moses says to God. God says, you know, you can't see me and live. I'll tuck you behind the cleft of this rock here. And what passed by God, his glory, his goodness. And at the essence of God, Moses understands, I will as he hears God, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and to show compassion on whom I will show compassion. The essence of what it means to be God, one writer said, is sovereignty. Sovereign choice. All using singular language here, not for nations, but of people. This is the way God operates. Thomas Arnold said the distinction between Christianity and all other systems of religion consists largely in this, that in these others, men are found seeking after God, while Christianity is God seeking after men. Truth has inferences, verse 16. So then, it follows, it depends not on human will or exertion, human will is your purpose, your desire, exertion, the execution of it, it doesn't depend on man's capacity at all. Why? Because we know we're depraved, fallen. But on God, it depends on God who has mercy. And talk about it depends on a nation getting together and voting. No. Proof number four. Paul just keeps adding it up. And the sooner you just submit to Scripture and say, I know it's hard, but I'll just believe it, the better. Proof number four for God's sovereign choice is that God chose Pharaoh to do his work sovereignly. God sovereignly chooses Pharaoh to do his work. Or I could put it, God gave mercy to Pharaoh, but, excuse me, mercy to Moses, but hardened Pharaoh. Verse 17, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, see there's the word again, I have raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. That's why God chooses some and not others because he wants to show his greatness and his name. So then he, who, he, so then he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. No one deserves mercy. No one deserves grace. I demand mercy, God. God hardens Pharaoh's heart so that his signs might be proclaimed in the land of Egypt. Exodus chapter 7. We're talking about individuals now. You say, yeah, but God hardened Pharaoh's heart because Pharaoh hardened his heart to God. Uh, sorry, it's the other way around. Exodus 4, I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Before Pharaoh hardened his heart, God said, I'm going to harden his heart. Yeah, but you know what? Here's a question. I got a question again. Since God's sovereign, how can I be? What's the question? 
Well, the first question is, is God unjust? It can't be injustice with God. Second question, if God chooses some people and not others, how are those others not chosen accountable? How can I be held accountable? Verse 19, you will say to me then, because he knows. This has probably gone through Paul's mind, and now he's telling others so they understand. This is the word of the living God. Why does he still find fault? Who can resist his will? Since the salvation of mankind is in the hands of God, and to some he puts out the scepter to say, you can uh, be part of my family, to others he doesn't. How can he blame people for their choices? How can he blame people for their actions? Again, we're using singular language here. Who? This is not nation language. This is individual language of God's sovereignty. And then we have one of those verses that's in the Bible that we're wise to pay heed to. Read Job 38 through 40 for a Q&A time with God. Uh, it's all fine and dandy while you're asking God the questions until he begins to ask you the questions. But who are you, O oh man? Who are you created being? Who are you finite and fallen and gray-haired and balding? Who are you, you little pipsqueak of a man is the idea? To answer back to God. God is questioning the people now. Job figured out pretty quickly it's, it's time to just, what do we say to the kids? It's time to zip the lip. Will the thing that is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? This is a preposterous thing to ask. It's none of our business. God owes no answer to anyone. Top lady said the apostle hinges the whole matter entirely on God's absolute sovereignty. To ask God why and to put God in a school desk and ask questions it's preposterous. We can't question. We can't criticize. John Calvin said, let us treasure the following observation in our minds. Never to feel the least desire to attain any other knowledge concerning this doctrine except what is taught in Scripture. When the Lord shuts his sacred mouth, let us also stop our thoughts from advancing one step further in our inquiries. Don't insult the Creator. Creatures aren't entitled to register complaints about their creator, J.I. Packer said. No complaint boxes for God. Now, if I was going to teach this in Awana and I wanted to get the kids' attention, I'd say something like this. When you feel the urge to begin to ask God questions and put him on in the witness stand, remember that you're fallen and finite and created. And then what would I say, kids, that you're probably not allowed to say at your house? I just want to make sure everybody's awake. It's time to shut up. That's the essence here. It's okay to say shut up once in a while if you're Paul. Right? <laughs> we just should be quiet. Just, just, you know what? There's a time to stop talking. You're going to dig that hole deeper. Because if the question is really, do you know what? I'm just curious. I'd like to understand unconditional election. I'd like to understand reprobation. What about double predestination? I'd just like to know what the answer is. Friends, that's fine to ask. I think that's wholesome to ask. I think that's good to ask. But the second there gets the turn on the question where you're saying, God, how could you do that? That's when it's time to be rebuked. We deserve to be cast off forever. We deserve to be damned. Israel didn't, she didn't get her choosing by she was the greatest nation. No, God just did it because he, he wanted to. Order in the court. And then Paul goes on, verse 21. He has more questions. They're simple to be asked, hard to answer in our hearts because we're a prideful people. Has the potter no right over the clay? <laughs> of course. To make out of the same lump, you get this big lump out of the same lump, out of the very same lump, the same lump of fallen humanity. And to some, you make a vessel, vessel for honorable use. You make a, a really nice stein or a really nice coffee mug. 
See, that's what I'm going to make out of there. And out of the other one, what does it say? For dishonorable use. As some commentators like to say, you could use this clay to make a spittoon. You could use this clay to make a garbage bag. You could use this clay to make a privy pot. When anybody ever says to me, I'm not a robot, I'm not an automaton, I say, I know you're not a robot, I know you're not a puppet, I know you're not an automaton. Your clay is what you are. I mean, I don't know how many times, I, it's, just, it's in the psyche of people, but I'm not a robot. Yeah, I, I know you're not a robot, you're clay. The clay can't say, you violated my rights. Think about it, even on a lesser level. Who here is as smart as Louis Pasteur, Einstein, Bacon, the, the man, <laughs> Newton? God somehow didn't give you the intellect of someone else. That you're going to criticize him for that? You don't have the compassion of someone else? This is out of bounds argument. There's another question, though. The hand just keeps going up. Yeah, but if election's true, that means reprobation's true, too. Yeah, that's true, verse 22. If you study election, you've got to study non-election or reprobation. If you study unconditional election, you have to study reprobation, the eternal decree by God's, where God determines to pass some by without giving them grace. He withholds mercy to some. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, sounds like what he wanted to do because he hardened Pharaoh, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? That's exactly what he has done, and why did he do it? Well, we can't understand every reason for God not choosing everyone, but we do know this. Verse 23, in order that, here's a purpose behind this election, to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy. No one's treated unfairly, which he has prepared beforehand for glory. Both bulls deserve wrath, but only one gets it. Double predestination is taught in the Bible. You can go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. You can go to Proverbs 16, 4. But you can go to Romans chapter 9 as well. He chooses some. That means he doesn't choose others. Lorraine Bettner said, It pleased God of his sovereign mercy to rescue some and to leave others where they were, to raise some in glory, giving them such grace as necessarily qualified them for it, and abandon the rest to eternal punishment. Friends, I know it's hard. One man called it the horrific doctrine, the decree to come horrible. But God has determined to pass by some. So those who get mercy really appreciate it all the more. Luther said this mightily offends our rational nature that God should of his own Mere unbiased will leave some men to themselves, harden them and condemn them, but he gives abundant demonstration and does continually that this is really the case. Namely, that the sole cause why some are saved and other perish proceeds from the, his willing the salvation of the former. John Bunyan said, The least of mercies are not deserved by the best of sinners. God has not decreed to give faith to every person, and now we begin to understand why Israel isn't as a nation believing now because of other reasons. Now I'm going to give you proof number five. We've got to do these last two fairly quickly. Proof number five. If you'd like me to expand on these two verses, these next two points a little bit more, maybe we'll do a special Sunday night Q&A, or I guess you could always show up for next service as well because I have an additional ten minutes to preach the sermon. So... A lot of good that does you. <clears throat> Proof five, God even sovereignly chooses Gentiles to be saved. <laughs> yes! Looking around at this congregation today, hallelujah! He chooses even Gentiles to be saved. The Old Testament foretold of the calling of Jews and Gentiles. God's got a plan of 
not picking some of the Israelites because that's going to really make them jealous. Gentiles get into salvation. I'm forever glad because otherwise I'd be still probably uh, in England worshiping trees. Romans 9, 24. Even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. Some Jews were elected and others reprobated, and some Gentiles were elect and others reprobated as well. There's hope and salvation for the Gentiles, all in the theme of a temporary rejection of Israel. Verse 25, he quotes the Bible some more. God accepts Gentiles as indeed he says in Hosea, those who are not my people, I will call my people, and her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. Kind of a loose translation of Hosea 2.23, verse 26 of Romans 9. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called the sons of the living God. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have become like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. God chooses even Gentiles in his sovereign grace. And finally, number six, proof six, that electing grace is both sovereign and undeserved. Number one, God's word endorses it. Number two, God chooses only through Isaac. Number three, God chooses Jacob and not the rest. He chose Moses and not Pharaoh. He chooses even Gentiles. And number six, God is sovereignly determined to grant sonship by faith alone. By faith alone. This is the sovereignty of God. You could work for your salvation. You could never do it. But God chose to give salvation through the non-meritorious instrument of faith alone. See the refrain in verses 30 and following? What should we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it. That is a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith. But as if it, but as it, it's hard to study the NAS your whole life and then go to ESV. But as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone, Christ Jesus. As it is written, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And whoever believes by faith, by faith, and now here believes in him, will not be put to shame. God knew that Israel tried to achieve right standing through the law, but it was through faith. And they rejected the stone. Now, let me give you... A few words to close with. Number one, they all start with S's for the hidden Baptist in the congregation. Number one, submit. Number one, submit. Uh, friends, the best thing you can do is just to say, you know, I, I don't like it, but I'll just go along with it anyway. This is the first time you've ever heard me preach. Just go home and study Romans chapter 9. Study your commentaries. And just say, Lord, whatever your scriptures teach, I want to submit to it. Number two, study. Study. Study the Bible. I'm quite convinced that the more you read the Bible, the more you'll see unconditional election and God's sovereignty, and then it'll be helpful to you. The people that have the most trouble with it need to study the scriptures. Just start reading the Bible. Number three, struggle is okay. If you struggle, friends, we all go through it. We all go through it to see God rightly. It's a good sign. I'm glad that you struggle. Spurgeon said, men have no objection to a God who is really no God, a God who shall be the subject of caprice, who shall be a servile follower of their will, who shall be under their will, who shall be under their control, but a God who speaks and it is done, who commands and it's fast, a God who does as he will among the armies of heaven, such a God as this, it's hard to endure. Number four, if you're tempted to ask a bunch of questions that are rebuke questions, putting God in the box, silence is the best thing you can do. Silence. And then lastly, I have to close here. Sing. 
Or I had as another word that starts with S. Smile. Can you believe God chose you? This should be the, the balm that soothes your soul. God chose me. I've told you this a thousand times, it seems like, but it's probably only about six. The day that I said to Kim, when her name was still Kim Duncan, will you marry me? And then she asked to see my checking account. No, she said, yeah. she said yes. I couldn't hardly stand it. I thought, this is like the major coup of all time. I gotta quit getting married before she realizes the real me. I said, I just have to ask you one more time. Will you marry me? She said, yes. Then one month later, we got married. It was 24 years ago. And she knew the real me. She was stuck with me, though, till death do us part. Here's the thing. God knows all about us. He knows every sin we'll ever commit. He knows about our lukewarmness. He knows about our lack of love. He knows about our idolatry. He knows about all the times we don't love Him. And He chooses us anyway. And it makes me want to ask God, did you really choose me? Yes, I did. It makes me want to sing. There's a song that goes, Sovereign ruler of the skies, ever gracious, ever wise. All my times are in thy hand, all events at thy command. His decree who formed the earth, fix my first and second birth. Parents, native place and time, all appointed were by him. He that formed me in the womb, he shall guide me to the tomb. All my time shall ever be ordered by his wise decree. The most troubling doctrine in the Bible is the ultimate sovereignty of God, but it's the doctrine that helps you when you're in the midst of your hardest troubles. Let's pray.